when you hear the word chaos theory? Do you think it's an incredible pickup line for hot scientists? Maybe how crazy and complex the weather is. But here's the thing, you all know about chaos theory. Think for a second about any moment of your life where if you were a quarter second early or late, how radically different your life would be. It's an idea that we've seen in science fiction, books, movies, it's all over the place. But I want to tell you about how it became a science, and it really begins with this. This fundamental question of 1800s, not Europe, but the key question of if Europe, if the whole US, the US of the world, would go creaming into Jupiter. And it was such a critical problem of the day that King Oscar II of Norway and Sweden decided to commission a prize, which would become known as the first Oscar. And what he did was he created this prize and he invited all the top mathematicians and physicists to enter. Twelve did. And they wrote all these papers about this. The guy who won was this guy, Henry Poincaré. What he studied was the sun, the earth, and the tiny moon. And he wrote 150 pages and it was so powerful they said, well, hell, he's just got to have the prize. But then something happened. Somebody decided to check on the word. Of course, it was a grad student. And what he discovered, there was a problem. Some of the orbits, some of the solutions were crazy. They were complex. They were almost, you could call, chaotic. And the problem remained that way for nearly 100 years until no one could figure it out, until this guy came along, Ed Lorenz, until the 1960s. And Ed had access to one of the first computers and he was working on weather forecasting. And so he built this model, this very simple model. And what you do is enter the equations with these starting conditions that were up to five decimal places. And one day he decided, oh, this is hell, this is too much work, so I'm going to only enter it up into three. And then he got this kind of crazy result. It looked the same, and then suddenly it started to change and diverge and look crazy. And so he took apart the computer looking for this bug and he put it back together and what he discovered was this idea that a tornado it, could be created by the flapping of a butterfly's wings in Brazil. And no one could really understand this. And the story would remain this way for nearly 11 years until this guy came along, Jim York, in 1974. And Jim had two incredible things going for him. The first was this new incredible device, the first real data scientist tool. And that tool was something that sits on your desktop, this, the personal computer. And what Jim was able to do was he was able to put this thing, he was finally able to interact with the data, see the complex structures that Point Coré can only see with equations. And he also had another incredible thing. He was able to find very simple models. He was able to connect this to real life. And one of those examples was this. One of the very first physical devices to actually show chaos theory. And what he did was, he just connected this, and what you'll see is the complexity, the behavior. And he was able to connect this with fractals and all these rich ideas. And you'll notice about the complexity of the behavior, and if you try to guess when the last time that blue piece goes the upper piece, you might be a little surprised. And as he was working on this, one of the fundamental questions that came up is, great, we know about sensitive conditions. What the hell do you do about it? We can see beautiful pictures, but what can happen? In 1978, a satellite was launched, ISEE-3, and it had all sorts of great whiz-bang features and sensors, and all that was left after a couple years was equivalent propellant of two spray cans. That's it. And somebody one day said, hey, you know what, that's exactly the kind of sensors we need to understand comets. So wouldn't it be awesome to fly out all the way out to the, through this comet tail? So I said, hey, that's thousands of miles away. But somebody said, hey, that's the same exact problem that Poincaré did. A small body, a big body, and a medium body. So what they did is 37 burns, spray cans, five lunar flybys, getting close to 80 miles from the surface of the moon, they got all this satellite all the way to not just one comet, but two comets. So let's get back to that question about the weather. Is the weather chaotic? If we know there's sensitivity conditions, why run one weather model? We should run lots of weather models. In fact, that's what happens today. This is a, what you could consider the jet stream for many different models for a several day forecast. When the lines all line up, that's a good forecast. When they're out of alignment, that's a bad one. This is the first time a major snowstorm over the eastern seaboard was ever predicted. It was in 1995. And you can see this great agreement of the forecast over the eastern seaboard, and yet over the Atlantic, no real qualification of forecasts. And so today, this idea of chaos is being used not to just predict weather, but even now the same ideas to understand how cancer propagates in the brain. 
And it really goes all the way back to the simple idea that big, cha small, big changes can be a result of really tiny ideas. 